approach, that attitude too must change. Many thanks, and my apologies to the several speakers who have been unable to call this afternoon. We must now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11993 in the name of John Swinney on boosting the economy. I would invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Mr Swinney, Cabinet Se Deputy First Minister. You have 13 minutes. Less would be more today, please. So this is a welcome debate to set out the actions the Government is taking to achieve our twin objectives of boosting economic growth and tackling inequality. We enter 2015 on a sound economic footing in Scotland, notwithstanding the current challenges in the energy sector, to which I will return in a moment. Our economy has recovered beyond pre-recession levels of output, and we have now entered a new phase in the economic cycle, where we must ensure that growth is both balanced and sustainable, and that the benefits of economic success are shared by everyone. It is well understood that a strong economy is essential in building a fair and a wealthy society. However, the reverse is also true. A society that is fair and equitable underpins a strong economy into the bargain. A recent OECD working paper estimated that rising inequality in the United Kingdom knocked more than nine percentage points off total GDP per capita growth between 1990 and 2010. Analysis by the International Monetary Fund has also found that more unequal countries tend to have lower and less durable economic growth. These studies by respected international agencies suggest equality and cohesion are good for growth as well as for individuals. So the challenge we face is not simply returning to pre-recession levels of growth, but tackling the underlying issues in our economy and labour market, boosting competitiveness and reducing in inequality. We want to create a stable and balanced economy, one that is outward looking, confident and based on the core strengths of our people, one that is innovative and supported by investment. We are currently updating the Government's economic strategy, which I intend to publish in the coming months. This strategy will continue to pursue the successful actions we have already taken, but will also focus on how we can ensure the recovery is sustainable and of benefit to all. It will combine the, th the three strategic themes set out in the programme for Government of ensuring sustainable economic growth, building a fairer society and tackling inequality, and protecting and reforming our public services. In particular, it will set out an economic approach focused on tackling inequality, boosting investment and innovation, and maintaining a focus on internationalisation. Presiding officer, Scotland's economic recovery is now well established. Our economy has grown continuously for two years. GDP is above pre-recession levels, and the economic outlook is the strongest it has been for many years. Independent forecasts indicate that the Scottish economy expanded by 2.8 per cent during 2014, well above its historical average growth rate. The, reco the, the recovery has also been evident in the labour market data. Our inactivity and unemployment rates are lower than in any other country in the United Kingdom, and the employment level in Scotland has been at all-time records in recent months. Longer-term trends in Scotland's economy also show the success of the Government's approach. Since 2007, the value of Scottish international exports has increased by a third. Business R&D has increased by 29 per cent. Scotland is ranked in the top two areas outside London for foreign direct investment in every year, and the number of registered businesses in Scotland has grown by 10 per cent. So there is much to be positive about and encouraged by the economic data as we see it today. Uh, of course. Um, he's rightly um, identified the growth in the economy in Scotland, which has been matched throughout the rest of the UK, and has cited some individual programmes that he's promoted here in Scotland. Which UK programmes would he give credit to for also boosting the economy in Scotland? Well, as, as, as Mr Rennie is familiar, uh, my view is that the recovery in Scotland has been despite the activities and the austerity agenda of the United Kingdom Government. So uh, I simply, if he hasn't heard me on that point before, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just repeat it for the sake of, of, of absolute consistency and clarity in the debate. So not 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 notwithstanding the, uh, the, the uh, economic indicators that are positive, the Government is aware that structural ch challenges remain within the economy. The recovery has brought improvement in headline measures of output and employment, but recessions typically leave a structural legacy. This is particularly true within some segments of the labour market, where challenges have arisen or become amplified during the recovery. For example, underemployment remains a continuing concern. Working hours, levels of full-time employment and real wages also remain below pre-recession norms. 
This is a legacy of the recession, and tackling these issues will provide, will provide key areas of focus for this Government. These challenges are not, of course, unique to Scotland, and it is worth remembering that the Scottish economy has shown resilience in the context of the global recovery. For example, whilst our youth unemployment rate remains too high at 15.9 per cent, it is lower than in the United Kingdom as a whole and should be viewed in the context of an average youth unemployment rate of around 22 per cent across the European Union and rates of in excess of 40 per cent in southern Europe. And of course, in addition to the structural challenges that remain, sectoral specific challenges will also remain within the economy, as is currently the case in the oil and gas industry, as we have just heard in the statement from the Energy Minister. Recent volatility and low oil prices has helped reduce costs for some industries and provided a boost to households, but it's also caused uncertainty and challenge for North Sea operators. Whilst expectations are for prices to start to rise again, reforms to the North Sea tax regime are required to support long-term growth within the sector. The 2 per cent reduction in the supplementary charge announced by the United Kingdom Government does not go far enough in helping the industry uh, that has seen its competitiveness damaged by the high, a historically high tax burden. The mo uh, of course. I the Cabinet Secretary and today um, I'm sure we're all agreed that the immediate responsibility of us all is to ensure that jobs in the oil and gas industry are secure but alongside this there are enormous potentials in, uh, to exploit marine renewables and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could briefly outline what will be happening in terms of plans to support um, that going forward for transferable skills. John Spinney. Well, well, clearly, as, as uh, Claudia Beamish will know, the Government has um, pursued a consistent approach in relation to the support of renewable energy within Scotland. In recent months, we have seen um, mixed news on um, offshore renewables. Uh, we have seen the tidal sector gain in strength, and uh, we are very confident that the development path of the tidal sector, reinforced by some of the support the Government is making available and the commitments of many companies and investors, is that, uh, and with some of the projects now emerging into much clearer form, uh, particularly the, the Magen project, um, that there will be significant progress in the tidal sector. The wave sector has been more challenging, as Claudia Beamish will know, but the actions that the Energy Minister has taken to establish Wave Energy Scotland and to ensure that the intellectual capital and the capability of Scotland to take forward the, um, the, the, the wave sector and to realise the economic benefits of that will remain a central part to the government's renewable strategy. And um, the, uh, both the policy framework and the financial support available for government is designed to do exactly that into the bargain. And we will, of course, ensure that Parliament is kept up to date on the steps uh, that we take in relation to uh, wave energy Scotland. So to, to return to the point I was making on the issue of the oil and gas sector, as we look at the challenges that the industry faces, I want to assure Parliament and reinforce what the Energy Minister has said, is that the Scottish Government will do all that we possibly can do within the powers available to us, whether it's through the support for innovation or the support for skills or the support for infrastructure or the support for enterprise that the Energy Minister has set out. But the crucial point that needs to be addressed just now is the cost base of the North Sea oil and gas sector and the principal area of public sector activity that can make a difference in that respect is the taxation and fiscal regime presided over by the United Kingdom Government. So I hope uh, out of this debate, out of the debate that is going on in Scotland uh, at this moment about the oil and gas sector, the United Kingdom Government listens to the very clear call that we make today. Firstly, for the introduction of an investment allowance. Secondly, a planned and phased reversal of the increase, uh, the increase supplementary charge. And finally, and probably most crucially, in terms of long-term development, uh, the development of an exploration tax credit to encourage and incentivise development in the years to come. Uh, so these measures are central to strengthening the oil and gas sector and to meeting the challenges that we face at the present moment. The Government will continue to be supportive of the uh, the work of business within our economy and uh, look to work with business to tackle many of our shared challenges and priorities. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work will be taking forward the, uh, the, the report of Sri Mood on developing Scotland's young workforce, which outlined a range of actions uh, that will be taken forward in conjunction with Skills Development Scotland, local authorities and our delivery partners and in association with the business community to ensure that we effectively support uh, the development of our young workforce. In addition to this, the Government will maintain a competitive approach on business rates 
to uh, provide support to now over 90,000 small businesses within our country and to ensure that we have the most competitive uh, framework for business taxation within the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the central features of the government's economic strategy will be the encouragement of uh, the development of innovation within our economy. And last year's Research Excellent Framework found that each of Scotland's 18 higher education institutions <coughs> undertakes research of world-leading quality. Um, this will be central to developing the, the focus on innovation that will emerge from the government's economic strategy. We will also place particular importance on encouraging the internationalisation of the Scottish economy with Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Development International supporting up to 10,000 more businesses in developing the skills to go international by 2015. Presiding officer, um, the, the, the other element of the government's economic strategy which will be fundamental in uh, taking forward our agenda will be the whole area of activity in tackling inequality. And what we've seen emerging out of the recession is the, 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 the significant challenges that exist in tackling in-work poverty. And the government is working very closely with the Poverty Alliance to expand and to raise further awareness and commitment to the payment of the living wage by the company base of Scotland. Ev evidence indicates that around 80% of those in work in Scotland earn more than the living wage. So we owe it to the remainder to ensure that we improve the quality of their remuneration. I'm delighted that over 90 companies across Scotland are now accredited as paying the, uh, the living wage as living wage employers, 32 of which gained accreditation since Living Wage Week in November. And I think we're beginning to see the fruits of the collaboration that exists between the government and the Poverty Alliance on raising awareness on this point. I'll give way to Mr McNeill. I think McNeil. we, we all welcome the initiatives, wherever they come from, or, you know, on, on the living wage and to tackle inequality. Is there clear objectives in this, in this, uh, this strategy? Uh, do we anticipate a, a number of employers or a percentage of that remaining people in Scotland who don't receive the living wage as our targets? Will we be able to monitor the progress there? And as it linked to other other government policies like the cost of transport or cost of rent? We, we, we haven't to date set specific targets about the achievement of the living wage, but what we have committed to is open reporting to Parliament about the success of the partnership we have with the Poverty Alliance. Um, and, and I, I reinforce that commitment that we will do that, uh, but I do assure Mr McNeill that the Government will uh, give all energy and put all pace that we can into encouraging and motivating more employers to sign up in this way. And we will consider the point that Mr McNeill makes in terms of creating a framework around which we... Members uh, in his last I, minute. I, I'm, I'm certainly happy to give way to Mr Finlay if that... No, nope. nope, I'm not allowed to. Okay. I'll, I'll give way to Mr Finlay in the conclusion of the debate. Um, Presiding officer, in, in, in taking forward the point that Mr McNeill made, uh, the government will... Um, encourage more and more companies to sign up to the living wage through the Scottish Business Pledge that we included in the programme for government, which will essentially encourage more and more companies as a consequence of their discussions and work with our enterprise agencies and uh, being in receipt of support from our enterprise agencies to commit to paying the living wage. And that will become a more central part of the dialogue the government has with business. Um, we are seeing uh, progress been made in the development of the Scottish economy, but the government is determined to ensure that as we progress along the route to economic recovery, we do that in a sustainable way, but we also do it hand in hand with tackling inequality that exists within our society, and that will be at the heart of the government's economic strategy that is passed to Parliament in the course of the next few months. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. Now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 11993.3. Ms Bailey, you have up to nine minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate in my new brief, and I look forward to working with the Scottish Government and other opposition parties in the months and years ahead on the challenges and opportunities facing our economy. There is no doubt that recent times have been tough for businesses across the country, whether you're in a large or small business, in manufacturing or retail, um, in urban or rural Scotland, the economic downturn has had an impact. Markets were tighter 
turnover had declined, the workforce had contracted. In short, the economy struggled, businesses suffered, and working people experienced the worst cost of living crisis in decades. But as John Swinney has highlighted, things have improved. Thankfully, the economy is now growing. Employment is increasing. Confidence is starting to improve. But, you know, there is still a way to go. And whilst the statistics in the Scottish Government motion are a little selective and aren't measuring things over the same period, let me be generous and not dwell there. And whilst overall growth has improved, the economy has continued to recover, the last quarter does show a marked slowing down. So let's recognise the achievements of our businesses in growing our economy, but equally recognise that we have nothing to be complacent about. Because despite that growth, the recovery is not yet shared by all those in work. Too many are caught in one of the worst cost of living crises in decades. There is still continuing uncertainty. Zero hours contracts, low wages and underemployment. If we are to address inequality, then this matters too. It's not just a matter of fairness, it is an economic issue. The OECD, the IMF and others point out that countries with relatively high degrees of wealth and income inequality have lower levels of economic growth. So it is in the interests of us all to address this. And I'm glad that the Scottish Government recognised this, but actions do speak louder than words. And I therefore very much regret the opportunity to secure the living wage and procurement was not taken by the SNP Government. But there can be no greater danger to our economy just now than the falling price of oil. And I want to spend my remaining time focusing on this. Oil is without doubt crucial to the Scottish economy. The UK is the largest oil producer in the European Union and the reality is that around 90% of production is here in Scotland. We rely on oil revenues to run our public services. So the price of oil is not something abstract. It is central to our budgets. It's fundamental to how much we have to spend on public services like schools and like hospitals. We all spent a lot of time, presiding officer, contesting what oil meant for the Scottish economy in the past year. And I don't want to rerun the referendum debate, but please let me just make a couple of observations. Firstly, the White Paper said that the price of a barrel of oil was estimated at $113 a barrel. As of yesterday, it fell below $50 a barrel, more than half of what was estimated. And let's be clear, oil is not just some optional extra nice to have. We need it to sustain our spending. And let me share a quote with you. Scotland has run a net fiscal deficit in 20 of the past 21 years. There has only been one year since 1990 when tax receipts have exceeded total public spending. This suggests that over this period, North Sea receipts would have been required to fund public services in Scotland. Now, I hear some SNP backbenchers, just a second, I hear some SNP backbenchers howl in protest. Perhaps Mr Mason would tell me whether these aren't indeed the words of John Swinney's senior civil servants in a leaked Cabinet paper. Happy John Mason. Way. I just wonder if the member would accept that it was a mistake not to have an oil fund which would have made us therefore a less susceptible to ups and downs in the oil price. Jackie Bailey. Well, all I can say is you can't spend the money twice and I'll come on to a discussion about the oil fund and the resilience fund. But it is clear that those words, contrary to the howls of protest from the SNP backbenches, actually came from the government's own civil servants. So what would, no, so what would a halving of the oil price mean for Scotland? I'll let you in later, but I think you'd do well to listen. $50 a barrel means an 85% decline in revenues. 85%. That's almost £6 billion less on an annual basis. Another £500 million every year on top of the Treasury analysis released last week. And remember, that was the analysis that said there would be a 77% loss in revenue over the first three years of an independent Scotland. Now, I absolutely accept people might not always trust the Treasury. But it's an analysis that SPICE has today confirmed. Now, I take no pleasure in this, but if we are to be trusted and demonstrate fiscal responsibility, then we do absolutely owe it to the people of Scotland to think about this. Happy to give way. I'm grateful for giving way. Mr. I mean, is not the key issue now not to argue about who was right in the past, 
but what to do right now. And could I just ask in that regard, I don't expect Jackie Bailey or the Labour Party to respond to the proposals we set out in the statement right now, but since we are planning to attend the summit that they have raised, in, will she respond to our tax proposals to make it an all-Scotland proposal for the tax measures that are required? I will. Ms Bailey, finish. I hope the, the intrusion in my time will be reflected, but I am happy to give the Minister that commitment because none of the proposals he's come forward with actually are new. We need a greater sense of urgency from this government to protect the North Sea. But can I just, can I just talk about the cost to us, £6 billion less to spend on our budget? What does that actually mean? That's more than the totality of our school's budget in Scotland. That's the cost of all all the nurses and doctors in hospitals and community health settings. That's the entirety of the infrastructure investment programme for next year. How many schools and hospitals would we have needed to close? How many teachers and you nurses must close too. would we have had to make redundant? Give me. It's fine, I will. It is that serious, you know. And for John Swinney to simply dismiss this, as he did earlier, as we wouldn't have been independent by now, is frankly just laughable. But having said that, I am pleased that both he and Nicola Sturgeon now seem to recognise the strength of being in the United Kingdom. But there are significant employment consequences too. Oil and Gas UK suggests that as many as 35,000 job losses, um, including jobs supported by employee spending across the UK, would occur. Spice calculate 15,750 of the job losses would be in Scotland. That's one in 12 Scottish jobs in the industry. And that doesn't fully reflect the most recent fall in oil prices. So the lower the price, potentially the greater the job loss. 23 years ago today, the closure of the Ravenscraig Steelworks was confirmed by British Steel. The challenge we face in the oil industry today threatens a larger loss of jobs than Ravenscraig. Given the economic devastation that this would cause, I genuinely don't understand the Scottish Government's reluctance to do anything urgently. This is one of Scotland's most significant industries. These are exceptional circumstances. The future of families across the North East and Scotland needs exceptional thinking. To simply say, I've, I've taken enough interventions, I'm sorry, to simply say that it is reserved demonstrates a government lacking in ambition. The SNP have been listed missing in action, not just by me, but by the oil industry. I am always happy to make common cause with the government. But why were the First Minister and Deputy First Minister not at the oil summit in Aberdeen this week? Why have they not yet confirmed that they will join a cross-party delegation to make the case for help to the UK government? Will they support Labour's call for a resilience fund and work with us to put something in place? Now, <laughs> presiding officer, it, Order. Is, it is truly, truly Mr. depressing Swinney. that the government and SNP tweeters deliberately choose to misunderstand a resilience fund and instead talk about an oil fund. And I've had this conversation with John Swinney. He knows fine well that these are two different things. And frankly, with almost 16,000 jobs at stake, they should be ashamed of themselves for playing these games. A resilience fund, presiding officer, would not just be for the oil industry. It is for times of economic shock. Exceptional circumstances, whether there are large-scale redundancies or an unexpected crisis in a particular industrial sector. It is a sensible intervention on the part of a government that should care about sustaining the Scottish economy. Don't spend all your time blaming people. Do something. And it is not too late for John Swinney and the SNP to work together with us to deliver this. Finally, presiding officer, there is the oil and gas bulletin. Published by the Scottish Government on a couple of occasions prior to the referendum, we're advised that there are no plans to produce them in the future. Let me ask one simple question. For goodness sake, why? Because forecasting and estimating such a valuable commodity that matters close, so please. much to our public finances makes sense. Presiding officer, the Scottish close. Government has to stop hiding. Our oil industry is on the brink of a crisis. You cannot simply say a big boy did it and then ran away because the people of Scotland deserve better. Thank you very much.
Before I call Gavin Brown, who will have up to six minutes, I want to advise other open debate speakers that they will now have their speaking times reduced to five minutes. The open debate speakers who have already been advised that their speeches will be cut to three minutes will remain at three minutes, but other open debate speakers will be reduced to five minutes. Mr Brown, up to six minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, thank you. Can I start by moving the amendment in my name and by also uh, welcoming Jackie Bailey uh, to her new role, and I look forward to working with and against her uh, in the coming uh, months and years. I enjoyed her contribution, but it certainly is a case of new, new Labour when even Jackie Bailey says you cannot spend money twice. <laughs> words, words I thought I would never uh, hear her utter, uh, presenting officer, I have to say, and uh, my goodness, I'm impressed. Uh, uh, presenting officer, let me, uh, it, it, it also opening, let me also say I welcome uh, Mr Swinney's announcement that there will be an updated uh, economic strategy uh, in the coming months. Obviously, there was one in 2011. Things have changed since then, and I think it is appropriate that we have an updated strategy. I look forward to seeing it. Um, he did say the coming months it would be helpful in closing if there's, if there's any way of uh, being a little uh, clearer on that. But also, I just hope that it is a strategy that uh, has genuinely new initiatives, some genuinely new approaches, and actually is a, an updated strategy, not just uh, a fresh cover and a, a lick of paint, if you like, but actually a new strategy for how we take forward. But uh, I take it on its merits. I welcome the, the announcement. I look forward uh, to hearing more about it. Uh, presenting officer, we were able to uh, support, I think, probably the first uh, half to two-thirds of the government motion. I think they make uh, some perfectly reasonable points about unemployment, um, about exports, business research, um, registered businesses, uh, and a number of other points. I think these are good news. These items are good news. They should be celebrated, and we should acknowledge uh, where the economy is performing well. And I have to say, over the course of the past year, and particularly in the past few months, most of the statistics have been healthy, uh, they have been uh, positive in their own right and moving uh, also in the correct direction. Growth uh, was pretty good for 2014 and is looking good for 2015, and um, perhaps a little lower beyond that. Employment, I think, is higher than anyone uh, really had anticipated. Unemployment um, didn't fall as much, uh, sorry, didn't uh, grow as much as we would uh, thought during the, the heart of the crisis, but actually the falls in unemployment are pretty swift now. Um, and while there is still some distance to go, uh, I think uh, progress has been pretty swift on there. So a lot of positive statistics. Where, where, where I think I have to make this point, and Willie Rennie made the point in his intervention, um, ultimately, uh, while the Scottish Government has delivered, I think, some good policy objectives, with the small business bonus being one, most of the main macroeconomic levers are held at a UK level. And so, therefore, where we do have an upturn, where things are going positively, I think it's right uh, to give credit uh, to the UK government as well. And I know Mr uh, Swinney is a fair man, and he's maybe itching to make amends for the comments he, he made in his speech, where he, refused to, where he refused to acknowledge it, and I'll give way to him if that's what he's uh, hoping to do. And Mr. Mr Brown is absolutely right. I'm a fair man and I, I, just want to, I just want to put on record the fact that I deeply appreciated the Chancellor's compliment to Scotland about the fact that we were presiding over the most significant employment growth in the United Kingdom. I thought that was a very decent compliment the Chancellor paid to the Scottish Government. Brown. Presiding officer, even when, when asked to make amends and to say something positive about the UK government, all he can say is uh, the UK government said something positive about him uh, and uh, his government. But per perhaps, perhaps in his closing speech he'll take time. But let, let, let's be realistic. I, I think the actions of the UK government have made a significant difference. I think it was a tough job for the Chancellor to hold the line, um, but I think we're seeing the fruits of that now, and I think we'll continue uh, to do so uh, in the months and years ahead. Um, presenting officer, um, my, my one gripe, though, or one gripe I have with the Scottish Government is that while they uh, put a good PR picture forward and things are going well, they do, in my opinion, ignore bad news to the extent of ignoring it so much that we don't actually do anything about it. And there are bits of bad news that have come out over the past couple of months, and I think the Scottish Government really needs to take on board seriously. Their own publication entitled Businesses in Scotland uh, showed that there was a decrease in private sector enterprises uh, between March 2013 and March 2014, a decrease of 2.4 per cent. Their own monthly economic brief showed that the growth gap uh, between the UK and Scotland is probably going to be bigger in 2015 than it was in 2014. 2014 was 3 per cent versus 2.8 per cent. It's projected 
and this is obviously a projection, uh, to be 2.4 per cent versus 2 per cent uh, in 2015. So a gap that is growing. We did see a small drop in manufacturing over the course of the year, whereas the UK saw growth of 3.6 per cent. And of course, we had the uh, retail sales index figures where volume and value uh, were flat uh, in Scotland over the course of the year. Value actually fell slightly, whereas the UK grew by 2.9 per cent in volume and 1.9 per cent in value. Now, I don't put those figures forward just to say that the UK is great and just to try and paint a gloomy picture, but I do feel that where there is less positive news, the Scottish Government needs to acknowledge it. It secondly, needs to explain it, and thirdly, most importantly, needs to provide some form of response about what we intend to, be, to do about them. They may be blips at this stage, but if those blips are ignored and action not taken, they can become problematic for our economy. Let me touch on oil, Deputy Presenting Officer. Uh, much has been said about uh, that, by that already, but I, would, I, I do find it staggering that the Energy Minister, in uh, an eight-minute uh, presentation, a thousand words or so in a speech, doesn't mention price once. I didn't expect him to dwell on it. I didn't expect him to make that the key focus of his speech. But I do think to not mention it at all, I have to say, uh, when it's down at $50 a barrel and, and potentially going to go lower, is a little bit unusual. And I found it also a bit strange as well that he criticised incessantly must close, the please. fiscal regime, which is the biggest barrier to development. Yet only a few months ago, a month ago the government policy were we to become independent was to adopt the entirety of the UK fiscal exactly. regime on oil and gas and most other things too. I find that strange, Deputy Presenting Officer. We're happy to close there. Thanks very much. We now move to open debate. Speeches of up to five minutes. Minutes. Mark Macdonald to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've said before that the way to address inequality is to create a strong and fair economy, one which um, businesses perform exceptionally, which leads to job creation and lower unemployment. Moving people into quality, well-paid jobs should be an aspiration both of government and of business alike. Now, I note from information provided to me by Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce that their 2014 workforce survey indicated that two-thirds of businesses in the North East expect to grow their workforce over the coming 12 months. Um, that, I think, is, is welcome in the context of the opening that, that I gave there and also in the remarks that the Cabinet Secretary has made about the increased confidence in the Scottish economy. I note further within their uh, oil and gas survey of 2014 that 29% of operators and 55% of contractors anticipated an increase in total employment. Um, now, obviously, that was looking ahead to 2015 in November 2014. I'm unclear as to whether that has been uh, altered significantly as a result of what has happened uh, in terms of the oil price. But what I would say is that I think that what we have to bear in mind is that the uh, oil and gas industry has been here before in terms of uh, low oil prices, and it has come back strongly. And I think we have to reflect upon that. I mean, it was only five years ago, uh, less than, uh, sorry, five, five and a half years ago, that the price had dipped below $50 a barrel in 2009. And so we, we have been in this situation previously in the Northeast, and the oil and gas industry has come back, has, has come back strongly. I would say, uh, in terms of the, the comments that have been made, that uh, somehow the, the government's approach in looking at the fiscal regime um, is, is the wrong thing to do. Uh, I would quote uh, from the, the opening remarks to the oil, oil and gas survey from Robert Collier, the chief executive of Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. We know that the fiscal regime needs to be addressed. Nearly two-thirds of respondents told us this immediate action from the government is required. And further on, within the survey itself, it states quite clearly 62% of all firms believe that the government's top priority should be a revision to the fiscal regime to ensure it encourages exploration and extraction. And that was before the, the dip in the oil price that we are currently experiencing. So if it was vital for it to happen then, it is surely even more vital for it to happen now, and I would say in terms of the proposals that the Labour Party have put forward, I'm always interested to see what proposals uh, are, are put forward. But in terms of the Resilience Fund, I'm unclear on the total sum that would be... Uh, I'll have to wait for the closing speeches of Jackie Bailey wants to interview me. I'm unclear on the total amount that is going to be committed. I'm unclear on who the beneficiaries of that sum would be and how that would be determined. And also, uh, I'm unclear on whether this is a fund that they're looking to have recur on an annual basis. And if so, what the difficulties that may arise from that are if they're basing it purely on consequentials, which, as we know, 
know requ require for that spending to be recurrent rather than for it to end uh, in a particular financial year. But I want to focus on the wider North East economy and some of the challenges uh, and opportunities that present ahead. Uh, there is a, a vibrant economy in the North East and we should not get too bogged down in talking simply about the oil and gas industry, because there are other sectors who are performing exceptionally. Life sciences in, the Aberdeen, uh, in, in Aberdeen are performing exceptionally, and I have visited a number of life sciences companies in my constituency to see some of the strong work that is being done there. In terms of the food and drink sector, 30, uh, according to the Food and Drink Survey of Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, 36 per cent of food and drink uh, respondents to their survey are currently exporting, which is up uh, from 29% in 2011, a further 24% looking to export over the next two years. We have a strong story to tell in this, the economy in the northeast of Scotland, and we should not be afraid to tell it. That said, there have been long-standing challenges in terms of the infrastructure in the area, and I welcome the investment in the Western Peripheral Route and the Harrigan Improvement, which will take place in my constituency, which will be of enormous benefit to connectivity. I think that the third Don Crossing, I've always thought, was a vital part of the infrastructure in the North East, and I'm glad that Labour and Administration and the Council are now behind that completely. In terms of Aberdeen Airport, the redevelopment of the terminal uh, is a welcome step forward, but there are two key issues that need to be brought forward there and which we must continue to press the case on. The first is air passenger duty and the early devolution uh, and action to reduce air passenger duty, which causes difficulty in maintaining some of the routes and attracting new routes to Aberdeen Airport. And secondly, ensuring that we continue to have slots at Heathrow for Aberdeen Airport, because that is vital for businesses in the North East, and I hope that's a case that the government will continue to press. Many thanks. Now, Colin Siobhan McMahon, to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Up to five minutes, please. Okay, I'd like to start my speech today by welcoming the fact that Scotland has the lowest levels of unemployment in the UK. This, of course, is good news. However, it would be wrong to think that having a lower rate of unemployment tells a full story. In fact, the unemployment rate for men in Scotland is higher than the rest of the UK. And those aged between 50 and 64 are more likely to be unemployed in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. This is just one of the reasons that boosting the Scottish economy is so important. Another key reason is the underemployment rate we are currently experiencing. <laughs> According to a SPICE briefing, there are an estimated 58,600 people aged between 16 and 24 who are regarded as underemployed. This equates to around 19 per cent of 16 to 24 year olds who are in employment. This is an extremely important statistic. The fact that we are not utilising our workforce in the best possible way means that our economy isn't working to its capacity. Given the importance of this matter and the significance of, of it, can I ask the Scottish Government what plans they have to solve this particular problem? We also have to have a more concentrated effort on women and employment. It is true that Scotland has a better rate of women in employment than the rest of the UK, and that is to be welcomed, but there is still a lot more to do. Given that in 2013 it was estimated that there were more women, 119,600, underemployed than men, 114,500, we have to begin to address the type of work that is on offer to women. This, of course, is a historic problem that many governments have wrestled with, but we are now in 2015, and it is simply not good enough to continue with war and words rather than real action. The fact remains that there is a 17.5 per cent pay gap between men and women in Scotland. This is something that has been highlighted today at the joint UK Government and Scottish Women Convention Gender Pay Gap event. I hope that, that, that what comes from that event today is a solution to the unacceptable statistic. According to a SPICE briefing on the earnings in Scotland in 2014, the difference between men and women's pay is also a complex issue that is difficult to cover using one indicator. However, one measure which they use to provide a useful comparison of male and female pay is hourly pay, excluding overtime. This is used because men are more likely to be in full-time employment and work overtime than women. Therefore, annual or weekly pay does not provide a fair comparison. On average, a female earns £10.63 compared to £12.88 for men. Additionally, the medium full-time hourly earnings, excluding overtime, have increased for both men and women in Scotland. However, only men have seen a real terms increase. This is the situation that women in Scotland are facing today. If they find themselves in work, the majority will find themselves with less pay than their male counterpart, and this may be compounded by a failure to utilise them in the correct way, leading to higher rates of underemployment. As a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, I heard the evidence from a number of women and representative bodies who spoke about the need for more meaningful work for women and for the work that they do currently to be recognised in financial terms. They were quite clear in their view that we need more flexible working patterns in Scotland, but we should not replace the word flexible with part-time. 
I would urge the government to come forward with a plan for flexible working for both men and women for the public sector. I believe that if we had such a plan, we would see our underemployment rates fall. We would see that women would be able to receive more hours for the work they do and not be restricted by part-time hours. We would see earning rise, meaning that the figure of 14 per cent of men and the 20 per cent of women who earn less than the living wage last year would be a thing of the past, and as a result, we would see greater benefits to our economy. It has been widely reported today, although not on the government's own website, that there was a record underspend, some £440 million, by the Scottish Government. That is simply unbelievable, given the challenges many in Scotland are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, having an underspend is, some, is not something new. Governments of all natures, local and national, have underspent their budgets in the past. People understand this. However, what we don't understand is when we have people queuing at food banks, people unable to heat their homes, a crisis in our NHS, our teachers having to pay for their own materials for the classroom whilst paying more in their pension contributions, and yet the government have failed to spend the money they have and failed to spend it in such a considerable way. All of this has an impact on our economy. That is not the way to achieve the social equality that the government talk about in their motion today. It is quite clear that the money could have been put to greater use if it had been devolved locally. Given that the Smith Agreement recognised the need for greater local devolution to achieve greater empowerment of our communities, can I ask the Government what action they have taken on this recommendation and how they will involve their local authorities in particular in plans that they may have started work on? When I started my speech, I welcomed the fact that our unemployment rates are falling. I do welcome this and wish to see it decrease further, but without the ambitions and plans to do this, and given the other challenges I mentioned, I fear that this may not be achievable. As a result, our economy cannot reach its full potential, and that is something the government must address and address now. Thank you. Thanks. Now call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. C can I first of all say that this carry-forward carry money um, from the Scottish Government's budget, the Labour Group should look to their own time in office, when um, money was put aside every year, never spent and almost lost back to the UK Treasury. Can I go back today to the motion which uh, explicitly links the delivery of sustainable economic growth with addressing long-standing social inequalities? That is really welcome, because uh, already in this new year, 2015, we have held debates relevant to that very subject. Health inequalities, uh, mental and physical well-being. And of course, um, we know that mental and physical well-being generally reduces the lower the social economic background. That is why I would like, first of all, to say in relation to Gavin Brown's uh, amendment, in, which includes the UK economy is growing. Yeah, aye, but for who? Uh, child poverty and inequality are on the rise, and a recent report by the OECD made it very clear that growing income inequalities have acted as a break on e economic growth. And can I say that is under both Tory and Labour UK governments. So the approach of the Scottish Government, to me, is much more appropriate on many counts. Uh, I would suggest, uh, not least, for example, um, the, the appointment of Harry Burns, um, former Chief Medical Officer of the Scottish Government, onto the Council of Economic Advisers. I, mean, I think this focus on health and well-being uh, being given when considering the economy is very, very welcome. Uh, so that, that appointment is excellent because his knowledge and experience and his interest, deep interest, in health inequalities will provide valuable input into building a strong and sustainable Scottish economy, which leads to a fairer and more equal society. Yes, of course. Neil Finlay. I wonder if the member would agree with Jerry McCartney, who says that the, the, the easiest way or the quickest way to deal with health inequalities is to introduce the living wage across the board. Linda Fabiani. Could I suggest to Mr Finlay that he gets on to um, his own colleagues who are going to be talking about the Smith Commission proposals and gives backing to the minimum wage being devolved to this Parliament, because I'll tell you, that's a way yeah. to really start looking at inequalities. As I said, this focus on equality as well as the economy is so important, and we have a really good basis on which to build. And what's most important, we have a government here in Scotland which has an ethos to deliver. We have increased exports almost a third since 2007. Inward investment is at a 16-year high. We've got increased productivity, increased business research and development spending, and investment in innovation centres. This, of course, all links to our communities and what is the mainstay of so many cities, towns, villages, and districts right across the country, the mainland and the islands. That small 
and medium-sized enterprises, sole traders, entrepreneurs, innovators. And the latest figures show that the number of businesses created in Scotland is up by almost 50% since 2009, helped very much, of course, by the small business bonus, um, which has been pledged to continue by our own First Minister. And these businesses contribute hugely to the Scottish economy, um, providing services from retail to biosciences and providing employment of all sorts. In my own constituency, East Kilbride, we've got a plethora of businesses of all types, exporters, importers, manufacturers, distributors. So as I say, a good basis to build on nationally, but locally for me as well, as our town makes the transition from Newtown major industry employer. Uh, we, we have, of course, an East Kilbride task force set up to look at this, and I'm yet again waiting after months and months and months and months to hear how that's going from the local authority. Final minute. There's many, many ideas. Infrastructure and development working together, not just massive infrastructure projects, the success of which um, has been shown by this government, but smaller infrastructure projects, a bit of innovation, looking at development infrastructure together, brownfield sites rather than always looking to the outside of towns, for example, boosting local economies, skills and training. I'll go back to the Smith Commission on that. I do have concern about um, the, the, the Smith Commission, um, what's been given to us in terms of job creation, for example, because we're doing good work with colleges, we're doing good work with skills and training, and whilst we're, we're getting the ability through workfare to put people into jobs, we're not getting the ability to create these jobs, and that's what's extremely important, and that ties back in with the whole um, precept that we're, we're talking about here in this motion that I absolutely support it's about the partnership approach, government, business, trade unions, sub-sector and local government all working together for equality must close and play. prosperity because we should be partners. We should be working together for that and equality and economy should go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willie Rennie. To be followed by Bruce Crawford. Very strict five minute speeches, please. Um, the, the oil industry, of course, is a, a different beast from what it was years in the past. It's now a global business with connections right across the world. So although we're looking for many of the solutions and the tax base to incentivise exploration in the North Sea and other fields, we have to recognise that the impact will be on other businesses like FMC and Oceaneering in Dunfermline and Rosyth. Um, so I welcome the action that the UK government's taken. I know that Alistair Carmichael is up in Aberdeen today to meet the industry. I've agreed, along with uh, Alistair Carmichael, to um, attend the oil summit in Aberdeen set up by the Council. But we're not just waiting, the UK Government, for a summit. We're getting on with action now. And I know, following the Wood Review that they set up by the UK Government, that the recommendations on regulation and on tax have been taken forward. And many of the reforms have been announced already in terms of basin-wide investment allowances, um, offshore exploration in terms of seismic surveys, cluster area allowances, the reduction in the supplementary charge. All these areas have been explored already and further discussions are underway with the industry with a report due in the spring budget. So I know, having spoken to Danny Alexander and Nick Clegg in the last few days, that the UK Government are seized of this issue and are keen to make sure that the industry continues uh, with the investment that we need it to have to support the jobs that it provides within Scotland. No, not just um, so the UK government is active. I, I do find it, I have to find it say, difficult when John Mason, who's not in his seat any longer, um, implies that we're all idiots for not recognising that the oil price goes up and down, when the fact that they've been denying this for the last three years in the campaign <laughs> uh, for independence. Um, and I know it's an inconvenient truth, but the reality is that if the decision had been different in September, Today's debate would not just be about the jobs issues that we've got with the North East and the rest of Scotland, we'd also be facing a financial crisis, which would directly affect the public services that everybody in this chamber wants to support. I'm just grateful that we did not vote yes in September. The news on the wider economy is more positive. In the Liberal centre ground, we know the value of building a stronger economy alongside a fairer society to create opportunity for everyone. And we're making progress on both. In Scotland, employment is up 168,000 since 2010. In the last year alone, unemployment has fallen by 44,000. The SNP complains that it doesn't have uh, the economic powers in this parliament in order to make a difference. 
But as soon as there is any growth, any improvement in employment, any reduction in unemployment, they are quick to claim the credit. So the progress here is matching the progress in the rest of the United Kingdom. In the second quarter of 2014, Scottish GDP grew by 0.9%, matching the growth in the rest of the UK. On the same year, on the year that was up 2.6%, 3.1% in the rest of the UK, broadly similar growth figures. Manufacturing is growing faster than any other sector, and investment is set to increase by 11% this year growing faster in the UK than any other major advanced economy. Britain was one of the countries hardest hit by the financial crisis, but now has the strongest recovery in the European Union, the best recovery in the G7, the best job creation in Europe, more jobs created in the United Kingdom than in the whole of the rest of the European Union combined. Now, the SNP and Labour said our plan would not work. I'm just glad that we ignored their advice. It would be to their credit if they were to stand up now and apologise for giving us the wrong advice and admitting that they were wrong. Because they were wrong, Final we've got minute. growth. 168,000 jobs can't be wrong. We've also we've delivered that by making significant investment changes in the UK. 68,000 businesses have got the national insurance allowance, big business boost for small business, corporation tax down to 20%. We've actually made work pay by cutting tax for 2.2 million people and taking 236,000 Scots out of tax altogether. We've made a big boost in terms of cutting regulation, supply of finance with the Green Investment Bank and the Business Bank. On technology, billion pounds on investing in broadband and mobile infrastructure. The Technology Strategy Board investing in the offshore renewable energy catapult in Glasgow. These are all significant improvements. It would be good if the Scottish Government were to recognise the progress that the UK Government is making to provide that 168,000 extra jobs in Scotland since 2010. That's progress. They should recognise it. Thank you very much. I now call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. As a starting point, I'd like to reflect on the Chief Economist for Scotland's report on the state of the economy that issued towards the end of the year. The opening statement of that report was hugely encouraging. It stated, against a relatively subdued global economic environment, growth in output in Scotland in 2014 will record its strongest performance since 2007. The same report tells us that during 2014, in many ways, the Scottish economy surpassed pre-decession levels with continued growth, resulting in rising employment, falling unemployment and economic inactivity. The Chief Economist report's positive findings were also reflected in recent positive economic reports for 2014 from the Scottish Building Federation, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce and the Bank of Scotland. But the Chief Economist was also right in his report to reflect on the fact that real wages in the economy still remain below pre-decession levels. What this tells us, and I think we all recognise that, that while many people some fa and families are prospering in the current economic climate, those others who are in work and working hard feel trapped and frustrated by a life with low income. Some of the other wider reports that I mentioned a few moments ago also tell us about some key skill shortages in areas of construction, retail and tourism that have the potential to hamper some growth in 2015. The findings of the Chief Economist's report on real wages in the economy, when taken together with the skills shortages outlined in the wider reports, presents a real opportunity for the upskilling of our workforce. That is not, not down, all down to government. Companies can help themselves by finding better ways of developing the skills within their own workforces to help their own employees move into more skilled and better paid jobs. But, of course, companies and government can also work together so government can tailor interventions that it has at its disposal to best effect. We could hear from the Cabinet Secretary today about what more the government can do to better tailor its interventions in this area. Now, I know my, from my time in government that the Cabinet Secretary has a strong personal commitment to building a fairer, more sustainable and balanced economy. So with that in mind, I want to make a point to him today about how we invest spend in our infrastructure in future. 
Now, I know that this government will spend around £4.5 billion in infrastructure spend during 2015-16, and that's certainly something to be applauded. I also know that it's important to make the big investments that are necessary to bring about the vital improvements that are required to projects like the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow, the new Fourth Road Bridge, or indeed the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. The point I would like to make today comes from my experience in my own constituency. I believe that to create the fairer, more sustainable economy the government seeks, we could secure greater opportunity by shifting the emphasis from the capital-hungry big projects to spending on just as vital but more modest projects. I have seen at first hand in my own constituency the transformations organisations like Historic Scotland, Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park or the Fourth Valley College have been able to achieve through much more modest amounts of capital expenditure. Organisations investing in more modest but nonetheless important projects, while I believe creating more local jobs and resultant significant improvements in the local economy. Organisations in the main employing more locally based contractors, ensuring that greater added value from the government spending is produced for the local and Scottish economy. Now, I don't have as much time as I thought I would have available, but I want to try to cover two other points quickly. Firstly, in relation to ensuring that rural Scotland benefits in the way it should from the rollout of faster broadband speeds. The Cabinet Secretary will aware of written to him expressing my concern about these matters, in particular what could be done to improve the situation in my Stirling constituency. And I Final look forward minute. to receiving his response. Um, secondly, at the collapse of the price that dairy farmer is getting per litre per milk, down from about 28 pence per litre now to 18 pence per litre for some milk uh, farmers. I believe one of the longer term solutions must be the development of a stronger processing industry in Scotland. This would help create the more sustainable Scotland the government seeks. And this year of food and drink, developing the milk processing sector would be, should be a priority for the government. Finally, I think it's fair to say that from the series of reports, this government's on the right track and is far from complacent in its activities. That's why I warmly welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today that he intends to bring forward an updated economic strategy for Scotland, and I look forward to a debate on it in this chamber. Thank you very much. I now call Neil Findlay to be followed by Chick Brody. Uh, thanks, for President Officer. I welcome the fact that we now have uh, growth in the economy and reducing unemployment. The fact that more people are in work is a very uh, good thing. But as always with this government, they claim credit when things go in the right direction and blame everyone else, indeed anyone else, when things go in the wrong direction. And of course, we've come through a period in the last few years when we heard that you could only create growth with independence. You could only create jobs with independence and that a new oil boom was just round the corner and all would be well in, the land, in a land where oil would fund the new dawn at $113 a barrel. And of course, today it's trading around about 50. But I think the Cabinet Secretary and his predictions and his forecasts and may well have listened to the former First Minister, a self-proclaimed expert in the economics of oil, a bit too much. Uh, with his over-generous estimates. After all, Mr Salmond is a man who sees a molehill, uh, never sees a molehill without proclaiming it to be Ben Nevis. But I digress, President Officer. This is an important debate, not least in examining what has happened to the benefits of the growth that we see. Uh, and uh, we see the government congratulate themselves uh, on this. Uh, whether this has actually been passed on to working people is a different matter because one thing is for sure those benefits are not being shared fairly. We see at a UK level Osborne redistributing cash from the poor to the rich with tax cuts for his city friends and benefit cuts for the poor. Across the country we have eye-watering record breaking levels of wealth being accumulated by the super rich yet at the same time we see immense pressure on working people. Wages have fallen in real terms by £1,600 a year since 2010, we have seen the explosion of food banks, health inequalities grow year on year, youth unemployment, underemployment, insecurity at work, unfairness and low pay are still the hallmarks of our economy for so many of our people. The Scottish Government has failed to take the opportunities available to it to create fairer and more secure work and failed to develop redistributive policies that would help share our economic growth 
more equitably. Take last year's rejection of Labour's amendments lodged during the procurement bill. Presiding officer, the mask slipped during that bill, all right, when they had the chance to support our amendments that would have ensured contractors bidding for public contracts paid the living wage, the now First Minister instructed her party to vote it down. And when we tried to take action against companies who avoided their corporate taxes, they voted that down too, even though SNP members in the UK Parliament had demanded just that of the UK Government. And the same thing happens to our amendments on ending the exploitation by contractors employing people on zero-hours contract. Not one of the Government's backbenchers had the backbone to line up with us and vote for amendments that would have helped thousands of ordinary Scottish workers. More faces than Big Ben is what they have, presiding officer. And in the past year in Scotland, not at the moment, in the past year in Scotland, the number of people earning a living wage has risen, uh, earning under the living wage has risen by 32,000 to 427,000. Had the Scottish Government accepted, accepted our amendments, many of those people would now be earning more than they are now. The Scottish Government failed those people. The truth is, presiding officer, this government talks about growth, but never talks about redistribution. Uh, the only redistribution they have in mind is from the poorer members of society to the already well-off. They showed that with the planned corporation tax cut, uh, and they're showing it with their continuing underfunding of the council tax freeze, which disproportionately helps the better off at the same time as councils are left with no option but to cut services. Sandra White, briefly, the members in this last minute. Officer. I just wonder if uh, Mr Finlay supports uh, his new leader, Jim Murphy's membership of the Henry J Jackson Society. Would you say that's a good move? Neil Finlay. Uh, I thought we were discussing the economy, uh, Ms White. Sorry. I think that would be a better contribution you had made to tell us how your government is going to help the poorest people in our society. That would have been a better intervention. But the reality is it's only, the reality is it's only Labour that's proposing redistribution and growth. We will grow the economy by investing in our people and sharing the benefits in a more equitable way. That's why we'll raise the top rate of tax to 50%, eh, 50p. That's why we're introducing the mansion tax. That's why we'll freeze energy prices and offer tax breaks to those who become living wage employers. And that's why we'll tax the bankers to create jobs for un, eh, young people. All policies that the Scottish Government oppose. Thank you. Chick Brody to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, President. Officer. Um, I, I support the motion. Whatever vision we have for uh, Scotland, whatever hopes we have for people's health, education, uh, social infrastructure or welfare, all roads, of course, lead to a strong economy. Uh, it is the economy. Stupid. Uh, presiding officer, some, argument, uh, some argue for saying that the title of today's debate should have been uh, boosting Scotland's economy further. For despite the limitation of the economic powers uh, of, uh, at our government's disposal, one cannot deny the relative strength of Scotland's economic performance. The facts are stark. And even, even in the current subdued economic political environment, it is reckless not to recognise that growth in output in Scotland in 2014 was its strongest for seven years. That done with regularly balanced budgets. We have a, now a labour market drawn by rising employment. Where business uh, and consumer confidence is more upbeat and where uh, focused investment uh, uh, offsets much more difficult trading conditions. All of that and more immeasurable outcomes married to an environment that has highly skilled people, uh, has a wealth of natural resources, international recognition for our innovation and has an international brand uh, second to none. All of that and more and yet we still have a situation, a legacy of a recession which is been mentioned where real wages are still below those of 2008 and where there is spare capacity in the labour market. But that provides us a yes with a challenge, but more importantly a, an opportunity to address an imbalance in the income gap and close the capacity black hole. The OECD report just two months ago indicated that growing income inequalities are a break, a break on economic expansion. So we have to have a seismic shift to move towards a high-wage, high-productivity economy, where there is a clear alignment of activity both in the public and private sectors uh, with the government's national economic strategy. And to, I, too, welcome the announcement by the Cabinet Secretary uh, regarding the update of that strategy. 
And also, we have to consider where, where employee participation might help that, both not in just in financial terms, but also in decision-making terms. Now, we know what, presiding officer, we want to achieve the question uh, 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 and answer the question, how? Now, let me briefly dwell, if time allows, on just a few. The SME sector in Scotland is huge. 335,000 businesses, 98% of which employ fewer than 50 people, representing 42% of Scotland's private sector employment and 24.5% of its turnover. The 46% increase in business startups, 21,540 in 2013, up from 14,725 in 2009, shows that small businesses are rising uh, to the challenge and aided and abetted by the government's initiative on small business bonus scheme. The FSB con uh, confidence index last year showed that the balance of Scottish small businesses had planned, they'd planned in the Q4 of last year to increase future capital investment over the next 12 months. With existing financial support, with the encouragement to pursue funding opportunities through the European 70 billion Horizon 2020 SME engagement scheme, we can support Scotland's SMEs with greater participation and help in research and innovation. That and a further alignment, as I said earlier, to the national economic strategy and a supportive business environment to grow markets, develop sectors, to grow companies and therefore employment makes the SME sector and alongside it the third sector a bedrock for long-term economic and jobs growth. Now, briefly, presiding officer, other major areas to boost the economy, and we have to do that to be stronger when the current global slowdown reverses, as it will, involves capital investment and exports. On capital, with emphasis on more localised spend, with encouragement for councils to consider their reserves and disposal of non-utilised fixed assets uh, to, uh, should be used to inject capital and borrowings into localised uh, capital spend projects. And lastly, presiding officer, we have to use this next period to further internationalise Scottish products and services. We can build on, for example, the positive performance uh, in manufacturing exports last year. That's good news for uh, my area of Ayrshire. Notwithstanding, and they've done that, notwithstanding the strength of sterling and the weakness of particular markets, and that does bode well. With the right focus, the right alignment, we can and we will boost Scotland's economy further. Many thanks. I now call Graham Pearson to be followed by Christian Allard. Presiding officer, for those unemployed and on low incomes, the challenges of the economic downturn have been particularly difficult. But it should be remembered that very few families have come through the downturn unscathed. This government regularly hails the benefits from initiatives like its small business bonus scheme, as well as those from, for example, new Glasgow City deal designed to encourage an uplift. And indeed, there are positive aspects arising from such schemes. The truth is, however, it is not enough. Key economies are in the doldrums. Concerns remain about Greece and the potential impacts on the rest of the EU. Trade hostilities with Russia and a slowdown in China's growth all add to the lack of confidence affecting international trade. One direct result of this, for the Energy Minister's reminder, is the plunging value of crude oil. Since July, the value has halved to around $50 a barrel. In terms of public tax revenues, that is a loss of more than £6 billion per year to public finances nearly a quarter of the cost of running Scotland's public services. And it's on that basis, as well as the appreciation, that continued pressure is likely in the longer term, owing to the geopolitical tensions affecting so many regions of the world and the reality that America is becoming a net exporter of energy for the first time in decades, that we need to ensure that we have new ways to boost the economy. We must involve the private sector in terms of innovation and an application of enterprise, together with the development of new businesses ready for the needs of the 21st century. Unfortunately, there are few signs of radical changes we need to see across the communities. 
largely due to the government's failure to boost confidence by creating an environment enabling businesses to develop and grow. For many communities across the country, the notion of an economic upswing is an illusion. Employment in these communities is spasmodic, low paid and often subject to zero hours and short term contracts. The SNP government must come forward with a plan that first reflects the dire needs of our people to be employed whilst enabling the very vehicle for employment, the private sector, to benefit. In that context, Mr Ewing may remember I raised with him nearly two years ago the frustrations faced by SMEs navigating the public procurement process in Scotland. With the very many different application processes across the public sector, small businesses lost days and sometimes employed consultants in order to apply, and after incurring great expense, found that they were either not accepted as accredited of course, I will. Minister. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm pleased to inform Mr. Pearson that the vast majority of contracts won uh, in public sector procurement are won by SMEs. C can I just ask, just for clarity, does the Labour Party now support the small business bonus, and should it be continued to the end of the next Parliament? Graham Pearson. Uh, I'm afraid the Minister missed the point I was making about the procurement process. The reality is that many of these contracts are won by companies who are either out with Scotland and, as a result, use their UK or EU level of support to win these contracts, or contracts are often won by companies who are ill-supported to deliver on the contracts that they've won, usually because they are at the lowest level of price, and, as a result, they leave behind either a contract which has not been completed to a sufficient quality or ends up being fixed by local companies who were legitimate, competent and professional and are left to do difficult work at no profit when indeed they should have been given the opportunity to win the contract in the first place. I hope that the Minister will assure us that he will give some thought to the procurement process in order that our local companies, our local apprentices and our local communities can benefit from such contracts. Finally, the Government must give thought to the need for capital support for trade across Scotland and across Europe and should give some serious consideration to a resilient fund for the future. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, President Officer. Let me congratulate the Scottish Government on its ambition to boosting our economy further. And I say further because this Government has been working hard for the last eight years and with great successes. Scotland's economy continues to grow and our unemployment rate is the lowest in the UK. Presenting officer, those successes as a result of a government understanding businesses and using the economic levers at its disposal. The North Office knows uh, it has a great role to play in further boosting Scotland's economy. The multi-award winning Chamber of Commerce, Abenin and Grampian have been leading the way for many decades. I would like to thank Richard Elliott, the Chamber's Policy Executive, for sending us a copy of the latest oil and gas survey and two recent North East Business Week surveys. And I will have to apologise to Rachel. I had several meetings with Rachel and with her colleagues at the Chamber of Commerce when I always push the Chamber of Commerce to try to diversify and not always talk about oil and gas. But because we are quite short of time today, I might only talk about oil and gas. The Chief Executive of Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, Bob Collier, uh, in his comment is very clear regarding the oil and gas sector. I read, all four uh, confidence levels are at a six years low. The industry has a clear idea of what it needs to do following the studies chaired by Sir Ian Wood and Melford Campbell. I wish the opposition would read those surveys provided to us. I don't know if they got them. I don't know if they read them. The number one recommendation uh, that the industry wants government to act upon, the, that's the members of the Chamber of Commerce who said so, and Mark McDonald uh, spoke about it, but what he didn't say, it was the number one recommendation. And I read it again, we know that the fiscal regime needs to be addressed. Nearly two-thirds of respondents told us this immediate action from the government is required. Immediate 
action from the UK government is required. And what do we get instead? A mere 2% increase in the tax rate. Prior to 24th of March 2011, the tax rate was at 20%. The Dem coalition increased it to 32%. We heard of that before today, of course, because the minister uh, had uh, in his statement and talked about it. But I think it needs to be repeated because I don't think the message is going through. Uh, they paid the price in the 2011 election with two, with two uh, political parties. Would the same UK government reverse the increase? No is the answer. Instead, we took the tax rate to 30 percent, 10 percent higher than it was in early in, early in 2011. That's not a decrease. That's an increase of 10 percent. This is not how to boost growth, presenting officer. This is how to destroy an industry, presenting officer. And conservatives and liberal democrats will pay the price of the ballot box in a few months' time, just like they did in 2011. Because of this, the Chamber uh, of Commerce uh, survey, the oil and gas survey, is telling us that confidence about United Kingdom continental shelf is significantly down in comparison to previous years, with 46% of respondents reporting they are less confident. 49% of respondents are reporting that they were working at or above optimum levels in the United Kingdom continental shelf, which is also down on previous years. And of course, business confidence in overseas market is higher than the United Kingdom continental shelf outlook. Because what the opposition benches first to understand is that we need to be competitive worldwide, whatever the price of oil. And this was edited to early on in, in the statement we talked of the minister. We talked about internationalization. That was the lesson we learned in the 80s when we had a lot bigger crisis than we have today. And now, nowadays, because of, of the lesson we learned in the 80s, half of the sales in the sector are now abroad. And uh, as Mark McDonald said as well uh, from the report of the Chamber of Commerce, half of the operators are reporting a reduction in contract staff, with almost two-thirds expecting further reduction in, contracts, in contractors in 2015. That was what we said at the end of the year. But there, there are two points there that many in the Chamber failed to understand. It's first that we in the North East have had a skills shortage for many years. Many of us contractors were struggling to find staff anywhere to work in the North East. The second point, President Officer, is that many of the skilled for workforce is already working abroad. If the UK government doesn't act immediately, we are going to lose this workforce. Most of them, originally from the North East, will end up settling ab abroad. So major company needs to have that, that incitement, and we've got to make sure that we give that confidence uh, for, the, for, for the oil and gas industry. Because our share is the optimism of the industry, and they know what we are facing, and we are acting upon it, and we just ask the UK government to do the same. President Officer, this is why I will be voting with the government tonight, and against the Labour shameful amendment. The North EC is open for business. President Officer. Many thanks. And I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the chance to participate in this debate, though I fear I, uh, I might be painfully predictable uh, today, not only mentioning climate change during a statement from Fergus Ewing, uh, but it's possible I'll have something to say about GDP during a debate on the economy. Uh, so my, my boring predictability, uh, I think, will, will not surprise the Cabinet Secretary or, or the first, uh, Deputy First Minister. I do want to open, though, by talking about an argument that he set out in his opening remarks and which is reflected in the motion, this notion that equality and cohesion are good for growth. Uh, in fact, sustainable economic growth, as the, the, the government's phrase has it, uh, and tackling inequalities, the Deputy First Minister said, are not opposites. Now, I'd like to explore whether this is a useful argument. It's one that has been growing uh, globally. It's one that uh, I think is certainly a step forward from you know, a, a central argument that, that went before in previous generations uh, when the, the myth of trickle-down economics was still being peddled. The, the notion that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's clearly been shown to be false, not just in this country, but around the world. Far from trickle-down economics, we had hoover-up economics, where the wealthiest absorbed the lion's share of the material and economic proceeds uh, of the economy, 
uh, but the social and environmental consequences of generating that wealth were heaped on uh, those who didn't enjoy the proceeds. So this notion that equality is good for growth, that if we want GDP growth in future, we need to close the, uh, the wealth gap. We need to close income and wealth inequality. It's an argument which has been advanced, not least by uh, Thomas Piketty and by Joe Stiglitz and other significant global figures. And it's interesting that the government seems to be foregrounding this argument. It's one that we tried to draw out recently in a debate on wealth and income inequality. I'd like to argue that, yes, this argument is a step forward, a step uh, advanced from that trickle-down nonsense that we saw before. But it is only one step forward, and I would like to encourage the Deputy First Minister once again to complete that journey. It's not just that equality, social justice, well-being and environmental protection don't undermine growth rates. It is, in fact, that there's no simplistic link between them at all. There have been periods of time when GDP growth has risen and risen and risen relentlessly, which saw growing inequality widening uh, inequality, worsening health, increased environmental destruction. And there have been periods of recession in GDP terms which saw exactly the same problems continue to get worse. Similarly, there have been periods in which these problems were tackled, reduced by an act of political will in good times and in bad in GDP terms. In good times and in bad in GDP terms, it is possible to overcome, to tackle and to reduce these social problems. What matters most to us? That's the question. Does it matter most to us that we achieve the well-being of our society, its people and the ecosystem that sustains us all? Or does it matter most to us to measure the amount of money swelling around in the economy? Because that's all GDP does. It doesn't tell us how it's being generated. It doesn't tell us how it's being used. It doesn't tell us in whose interests is the economy functioning. The second weakness in this argument that equality is good for growth is what happens if we do return to a period of lasting economic growth, of strong and lasting economic growth. What happens to that argument? What happens to the case for building a more equal society, for improving environmental protection, for achieving the well-being of our society? What happens to that argument if it's predicated on the notion that we need equality in order to achieve greater GDP growth? If we return to growth, we will end up losing that argument once again. And the political pendulum would swing back in the other direction. Let's not win the argument for a more equal society simply in order to suggest that it's the best way of becoming richer. Let's argue that a more equal society is an objective in its own right. It comes down to what we believe in, what kind of society we want to build, and after that, then we achieve an economy which functions in our interests and does so within ecological limits. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I can give our next two open debate speakers four minutes each, and I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Alex Riley. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the great uh, achievements of the Scottish economy in recent years has been the dramatic uplift in our exports. But of course, Scotland has been an exporting nation for a very long time. I remember standing on the shores of Lake Titicaca looking at the ferry from Peru across to Bolivia, built on the Clyde. I visited the biggest Buddha in the world, which is just outside Rangoon in Burma. It sits in a frame that proudly says, manufactured in Kilmarnock. And everywhere you go in the world, you find bottles of whiskey waiting an appreciative uh, audience uh, to drink them. So our exporting credentials are long established and continue to be an important part of our economy uh, and to grow. And for many of my constituents and of colleagues in the North East, uh, we export our skills based on the experience of the oil and gas industry. And whatever the vicissitudes of short-term difficulties, uh, that will undoubtedly uh, continue. But one of the things I'm most delighted of is that we're no longer exporting people in any substantial sense. 
It's quite ironic that the new memorial uh, to the clearances that is at Helmsdale, which has the little child holding his mother's hand, looking back down the glen to the place they will never see again, is within sight, of course, uh, of uh, uh, the oil field uh, uh, just off the course, the Beatrice field, uh, which has, of course, been a pioneer in the offshore wind industry. Now, the wind industry is going to be an important part of our future. Harbours in my constituency at Bucky, at Fraserburgh and at Peterhead uh, want to get some of the action from the offshore wind. But the UK government's dithering, delay and damaging changes in the regime put at risk these new jobs, which are long-term sustainable, even when oil has ceased to be part of our economy. Uh, they will be important uh, to us. It's, um, it's worth saying, of course, that uh, I've heard some interesting things in the debate. It's always a great pleasure to hear Neil Finlay uh, speak, if only for the excitement of watching him wrestle with his own internal contradictions in the arguments he puts forward and wondering which side of him is going to win. Because, of course, when he criticises the uh, suggestions that Scotland should, as Northern Ireland is a before, going to before the general election, have control over corporation tax, he, of course, ignores the fact that Gordon Brown has cut corporation tax more often than anyone. Clearly, he's been criticising uh, Gordon Brown. And therefore, I can only assume that Mr Finlay is, of course, a Blairite. In my remaining 60 seconds... Uh, let me uh, just touch upon also uh, what Mr, uh, Mr. Finlay uh, was saying about employment. I'm delighted to hear him arguing for our having full power over employment law. I will join him campaigning on that on every opportunity. Uh, his recent uh, campaigning against that was not uh, too good. Let me just conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, by addressing uh, the please. issues that, uh, that, that Jackie Bailey uh, talked about. She seemed to celebrate the drop in oil prices, although, of course, the price that we're talking about that the UK government had from the Department of Energy and Climate Change is exactly the same as the one that the Scottish uh, government used. And we hear that in a year's time we'll be back to the same place. The long-term future for oil is as a feedstock for our chemical industries. We've got to get off burning it. That's certainly important. Presiding officer, I look forward to future prosperity and growth in our economy. Thank you. And I now call Alex Shiley. Presiding officer, I note that in a briefing that was given by the um, SCVO, they said we are heartened by the Scottish Government's recent and ongoing rhetoric about tackling inequality and appreciating that doing so is part of growing a strong economy. Um, they went on to say they were keen to hear more practical measures and that they hope the debate today will highlight some of the ways in which the Scottish Government will look at achieving its aims. And I think, sadly, they'll be disappointed because what's not come across today is how we intend to, or how the Scottish Government intend to tackle inequality. You would have to say that their track record over the last seven years has not been um, very good. But I do, I do appreciate that John Swinney um, kicked off this debate by saying that we enter 2015 on a sound economic footing. And he recognised that the more unequal an economy is, the less successful that economy will be. So there is a real opportunity in 2015 to start to tackle inequality in Scotland. Um, the economic strategy that John Swinney talked about bringing forward and updating, I look forward to that, and I do hope that he will involve all parties in this chamber, but also talk to local government and talk to all the partners that are out there, including the third sector, SCVO, and, and, and many, many more. Because if we're going to create a prosperous and fairer society, then we need to start to tackle poverty. It's also worth um, noting in the short time that I have today that in terms of the Scottish Government figures that were produced in 2014 with the latest figures for poverty, um, relative poverty 2012-13. There were 820,000 individuals living in relative poverty in Scotland. 
Um, that was a reverse in the reduction that we had seen in recent years with more than 110,000 people living in relative poverty compared to the year before. And I suspect the figures for this year will be even higher. So we see that there is a, a, an ongoing increase in relative poverty in Scotland. In 2012-13, the rate of people in absolute poverty increased by 17 per cent, some 880,000 people. Again, an increase of 100,000 people living in, in, in um, absolute poverty. So we need to be able to attack, attack that. And I would suggest to, the, to, 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 to Mr Swinney that if he, for example, was to start looking at, at policies like reversing the £61 million real-term cuts that's taken place in colleges over the, the last few years, then that would be a very positive step, because if we're serious about tackling inequality and poverty, then we need to do a lot more to get people the skills so that they can get the jobs that are available and the jobs that we should be creating. In terms of in-work poverty, we also have a major issue, and the same Scottish Government statistics show that nearly half of households in poverty, 45 per cent of all people in poverty, are in a, in, a, in a household where at least one person is working. Over half, 52 per cent of working-age adults in poverty are in working households. Six in ten, 59 per cent of children in poverty in Scotland live in a working household. The increase in in-work poverty in the, la in the latest year continues to slow increasing trends um, and, 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 and poverty and in-work poverty. So we need to be able to tackle in-work poverty, raising the minimum wage. Something certainly that is a platform that I'll be standing on as we go forward to the general election this year. The end is zero, end is zero hours contracts um, and being able to raise the living wage um, so that more and more workers, over 400,000 um, individuals in Scotland, would benefit from a rise in the living wage. I'm afraid I must ask you to come to a close. So, so, so presiding officer, in concluding, I hope that we can start to, yes, grow the economy, celebrate the success of the economy, but ensure that more and more people can share in that success by tackling inequality and poverty. We have the, power, the powers in this parliament to start to do that, and we need to get on with it and get on with it now. Thank you. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call in Murdo Fraser. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as Gavin Brown said at the start of the debate, there is much in the SNP motion today that we uh, agree with in terms of celebrating the success or some of the successes of the Scottish economy. These successes, of course, are not limited to Scotland. They apply across the whole of the UK. We have one of the fastest uh, rates of growth in the developed world. We are the fastest growing major economy in the world today. Net employment is up 1.75 million since 2010. There have been 2.2 million new private sector jobs created in that time, three quarters of them full time. Inflation is coming down and wages are now rising faster than prices. So it is a good news story. Now, of course, the SNP like to claim all the credit for this good news. In fact, Christian Allard did just that in his contribution a few moments ago. There are at least two reasons why I think we need to take that with a pinch of salt. Firstly, because the SNP have been telling us for years that they didn't have the power to make a difference. They didn't have the economic levers. So they can hardly, they can hardly claim all the credit for the success when they've said it's not been up to them. And secondly, as Willie Rennie uh, reminded us earlier on, the SNP, of course, opposed the approach taken by George Osborne and the UK government that has delivered this success. Now, the SNP were not alone in that. The SNP stood shoulder to shoulder with the Labour Party in their critique of the coalition government's approach. Mr Swinney and Ed Bowles could virtually have been twins. So close was their critique of the coalition government's approach. I remember Mr Swinney's colleagues calling for a plan B and saying that uh, uh, the Chancellor's plans would never work. He has been proved completely wrong. They have worked and they have delivered success. But there have been a few flies in the ointment in Scotland, and we should not ignore these. Uh, just last year, the, the retail figures in quarter two and quarter three for Scotland showed a decrease whilst going up elsewhere in the UK. 
In terms of the property market, the uh, RICS Residential Market Survey showed a decline in sales in September due to, and they quoted, market uncertainty. The Federation of Small Business uh, Confidence Survey showed a fall in the final quarter of 2014, greater than the UK as a whole, now meaning that uh, Scotland is the third lowest placed part of the UK in terms of business confidence behind just northeast of England and Northern Ireland. What could be the common factor, Deputy Presiding Officer? Could it be anything to do with September's independence referendum and the impact on business confidence? So the SNP should not claim credit for all the good news when their own obsession has potentially set us back. And the Mackay Consultants Monthly Economic Report for December concludes there are increasing signs that growth in 2015 will be significantly lower than in 2014. And we haven't even talked yet about the oil price. Now, I want to address, if I can, the issue the Cabinet Secretary raised uh, in his contribution and picked up by a number of others, including uh, Alec Rowley, just now in relation to the living wage, which I think is an important area to discuss. Because we agree with the ambition of raising wages and raising living standards. And I don't think anybody in this chamber is going to disagree. But this needs to be done in a manner that is affordable. And I want to give two examples of where there might be difficulties where we have low-wage industries. The first is in the hospitality sector, which is, in many areas, a low-wage industry where the introduction of the living wage would undoubtedly increase the pay of many of the staff involved. But if the staff pay goes up, prices will go up. And if prices go up, that will hit people in their pockets. It will also hit the competitiveness of the tourism offer from Scotland. And Scotland has already seen, as we always hear when we have debates in, in, in a second, as we, uh, when we have debates in this chamber on tourism, already seen as a high-cost destination. So we need to be careful about that. I'll happily give way to the member. Do you, not agree, or do you not think that if you introduce the living wage, hotels and other industries would actually see a more settled staff and less staff move, moving about? What do you say? Indeed, I'm not disagreeing with the member that there wouldn't be advantages to bring in the living wage. All I'm saying is to bring it in too rapidly or to bring it in without being aware of some of the consequences might actually turn out to be disadvantageous. And, well, no, I, want to, I want to move on because I have another point I want to make on this. And the, other, the other industry I want to give an example of is the care sector. And we know in the care sector there are very many low-paid employees. And care providers I speak to say that they cannot afford to pay more. Already, budgets are tight. In many cases, in fact, there are patients who are paying privately are, in effect, cross-subsidising those who are local authority funded. So if the government decides it wants to pay the living wage, it's going to have to pay more for care. That's going to mean funding local government more to pay the care providers more. So let's not suggest that this is a cost-free option, either for public spending or for household budget. I think I'm in my last minute. I'm afraid you are. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just wanted to say in closing, what we need is a more competitive Scotland. There is good news out there, but there's more that could be done. We support the small business bonus. That's continuing. We oppose the retail levy. That's now being scrapped, and that's good news. There are benefits to retailers south of the border in terms of rates that have not been introduced in Scotland. We're seeing a proposal to reintroduce rates on sporting interests, putting Scottish rural businesses at a competitive disadvantage compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. And we are seeing rates of land and buildings transaction tax being imposed in Scotland from the spring, which again will put us at a competitive disadvantage compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. All these matters are under with the control of the Scottish Government and all of them they could be dealing with now Afraid if they so wanted. We've had economic successes. We've had help to secure these successes by voting no in September in the referendum. Let's not now put them at risk. Thank you. Thank you. And now Colin Lewis MacDonald, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much. This debate has been wide-ranging as a debate on the economy should be. But I want, in closing for Labour, to come back to the critical issue of the challenges facing our oil and gas industry, the single most urgent, immediate issue facing the Scottish economy today and entirely absent from the Scottish Government's motion on boosting the economy. SNP ministers will say that oil is a bonus, it's not the basis of Scotland's economy, as if that made it all right not to talk about it in tough times. But I'm glad that Mr Ewing came to the chamber earlier this afternoon to make a statement about oil and gas, reflecting at least some degree of recognition 
that this industry is indeed of fundamental importance to Scotland's economy. I was disappointed that he had so little new to say, but I think the critical thing is that oil and gas are hardly a bonus when the industry accounts for up to one-sixth of our GDP and an even larger share of our export earnings. 50,000 men and women work offshore in what can be one of the toughest working environments in the world, especially on a night like tonight. And many thousands more earn their living in the oil and gas industry onshore, onshore and tens of thousands of jobs depend indirectly on the boost of the economy Minister. from oil and gas. Well, I'm very grateful for Lewis MacDonald giving way. To make progress, can I ask, will Labour support the tax reforms that we have brought forward today and which we believe should be implemented in the March UK budget. Lewis MacDonald. Mr Ewing talks about tax reforms that he's brought forward today. Mr Ewing will be aware that the tax reforms he's lobbying for are tax reforms we're lobbying for, tax reforms the industry is lobbying for, and tax reforms supported by trade unions in the sector as well. So the idea somehow that the proposition that there should be support for uh, development, there should be support for exploration, and there should be reform to the field allowances, those are not new things brought forward by Mr Ewing, albeit that I very much welcome his support for them. They are things that have very broad support uh, within the sector sector uh, and within the industry. The point has also been made by Mr Ewing and his colleagues that we have seen low oil prices before, and that is only too true. But it is too easy to forget just how damaging those falls in the price of oil were for the regional economy of the North East and for Scotland's industrial health in general. In the oil price recession of 1986-87, for example, houses that had previously gained in value from month to month suddenly became unsellable, and thousands of hard-working people learned for themselves the meaning of negative equity. $12 oil in 1999 was damaging too, and prompted the then Labour government to set up pilot, recognising the need for industry and government to work together to overcome the potentially damaging effects of a prolonged period of low oil prices. Mr Ewing, indeed, is Vice Chair of Pilot and should be better placed than most to recognise its value. So we know that a low price of oil can damage businesses and jobs, and we also know that a responsible government can make a difference if it intervenes effectively uh, to mitigate the effects. And that's why we need the Scottish Government to start by assessing the impact of $50 oil on the Scottish economy. What the impact will be, indeed, if the price continues to fall to $40 or below. It is a pity the government has not taken the opportunity they were offered this afternoon uh, to offer uh, to make such an assessment of that wider economic impact. But perhaps Mr Swinney, in closing the debate, will be able to do precisely that. Because this is not just another cyclical dip in the world price of oil, uh, like those the Scottish economy has experienced and survived before. Wood Mackenzie made the point clear in their report the other day on UK Upstream, a review of 2014 uh, and what to look for in 2015. Like Sir Ian Wood's review last year, they set out clearly the challenges the sector faces now that it did not face in 1986, 1999 or 2008. They found that future prospects are at risk. At a price of $60, 80% of unsanctioned profit. Uh, projects would fail to generate a sufficient return. They say there is real concern as a result over future investment with $16 billion uh, potentially at risk of cancellation or deferral over the next five years. Potentially uh, with new reserves that are not yet sanctioned which could be uh, put at risk by $60 oil, 220,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. Those are big numbers of risk as I'm sure the government will recognise, even for an industry which routinely invests billions of dollars in order to make big returns in future years. Because we no longer see a rising graph of production from the, from the North Sea, or indeed any realistic prospect of net production going up. A whole series of decisions are being made now in boardrooms around the world about whether to continue to produce from fields which are in any case uh, in the latter part of their productive life. We know that at least 30 existing fields in the North Sea require an oil price of $50 or more in order to be profitable. If they are not profitable, they will close down, and once a field has been decommissioned, there is no going back. So we need to intervene, and of course, it's right to say that part of that intervention has to be fiscal. But we also need to intervene uh, in the economic impact 
of changes uh, in the oil industry of the type that we are looking at today. Uh, and that's why Scottish Labour has proposed a resilience fund, not just for the oil industry, as has been implied, but one that would operate for any key sector of economy facing the risks that the energy sector faces today. Certainly. Christian Allard. Thanks, the member, for taking the version. I just wanted to know, as Jim Murphy asked Diane Abbott about the, uh, this new proposal, because we wouldn't want to study a proposal that some of our MPs in London wouldn't agree with. Lewis McTonton, you're in your last minute now. I'm afraid Mr Allard, uh, while he's clearly a, an avid watcher of uh, social media, has confused two quite different stories. But I'm pleased to tell him that Jim Murphy requires permission from nobody in order to bring forward uh, important proposals for the Scottish economy. What I want to know today is whether John Swinney has, uh, in the last couple of hours, secured permission from Nicola Sturgeon to agree to the proposal for a resilience fund to support sectors of the Scottish economy under pressure. Because if he does so, then we will be very uh, happy to hear that assurance from him today. But our challenge to the Scottish Government is to begin to take this crisis seriously, to recognise the fundamental importance of oil to the Scottish economy and to get on board with all of those who are calling for urgent action to save businesses and jobs. And it means being serious about being prepared to work with other parties, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk, and they need to get on and do that now. Thank you very much. I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Deputy First Minister, you have until just before 5pm. Uh, presiding officer, one of the obligations on a minister is when uh, a minister gives incorrect information to Parliament, they should correct it at the first available opportunity. And Duncan McNeill is not here to witness a moment where I'm going to have to do it in relation to his intervention to me earlier on, where I said to Mr McNeill we had not fixed a target for the number of accredited employers paying the living wage we wished to secure. But uh, I am advised that uh, buried in the programme for government uh, is the target of 150 companies by the end of 2015. But we will, of course, endeavour to exceed that. So I'm sorry that Mr McNeill is not here to witness that beautiful moment. I'm sure he will be watching it on the uh, video player endlessly to appreciate the moment. Um, Mr Brown uh, asked about the government economic strategy, and I can confirm it will be published in March. And uh, the... What I'd say to Mr Brown about the government economic strategy is that there is absolutely nothing new. No, sorry, nothing, nothing wrong. <laughs> I, was, I was, well, I was, I was getting on with that, but there's, there's nothing wrong with putting in material that we are already doing because it is the sound and correct things to be doing in the economy. Um, but what we will be doing is updating the uh, government economic strategy to reflect some of the challenges that we face and some of the developments in our own thinking, particularly on the issues around the tackling of in-work poverty, which is a more significant issue within the economy. Um, Murdo Fraser uh, chastised me for not being generous in, in, in applauding the success of the UK government's plan. I just remind Murdo Fraser that the Chancellor is borrowing £100 billion more than set out in the fiscal plans in 2010. Net debt is continuing to grow and is forecast to peak at 81% of GDP next year. Now, it's funny how none of that was mentioned by either Murdo Fraser or the other fanzine for the United Kingdom government, Willie Rennie, because it does indicate the fact that the Chancellor's plan, far from working, is actually delayed economic recovery significantly and growth that we're experiencing now, the Chancellor predicted in 2010, we should have been experiencing in 2012 and in fact didn't do so at that time. Now, Siobhan McMahon raised an issue about the uh, underspend and the discussion that's taken place about this. Of course, I made a full parliamentary statement on the end of your financial position in June to Parliament in which I made clear that the fiscal Dell underspend of the government was £145 million, which represents half a percent of our fiscal Dell budget. And the fiscal Dell budget is the budget we have available to spend. It is the cash that we can actually spend on public service projects. Uh, some of the other components of um, the underspend are in annually managed expenditure, which is not budget which I control, 
but which tends to be, for example, some of the budget cover that is provided for student loans. And that is entirely demand-led. And, and when it's not spent on student loans cover, it cannot be spent on other wider public expenditure. And I would finally reassure Siobhan McMahon that every part of that £145 million of the fiscal deal underspend um, was earmarked to be uh, utilised to support our spending plans in 2014-15 and that uh, I can confirm that that is being taken forward as part of the government's budget in this current financial year. <coughs> um, my friend and colleague Bruce Crawford made a, a very substantial speech to Parliament today in which he considered the analysis undertaken by the Chief Economist in his most recent report and weaved together the, um, the issue of the um, the, the performance on um, a reduction in skill shortages, um, the um, real wage crisis that exists within our society, and made it clear that we had an opportunity in the economy to upskill the quality, uh, upskill employment, and to upskill the quality of employment uh, within Scotland. But Mr. Crawford, I think, made the the, the essential connection that not all of that can be delivered by the government on its own. That is essentially something that can be delivered only as a product of a partnership between business and government, which is what the Scottish Business Pledge is designed to do. It is designed to say to the business community in Scotland that there are elements of improvement in the quality and the sustainability of employment that we wish to undertake and to achieve as a government in Scotland, but we can only do it if businesses work with us to achieve that objective. And I'm indebted to Mr Crawford for highlighting the importance of ensuring that business pledge is successful as a, an element of the government's economic strategy. I also will give further consideration to the point that Mr Crawford made about essentially um, decreasing the size and scale of our capital projects to, uh, make up, to, to, to provide a, a broader range of capital projects around the country. He will appreciate the challenge that there is in the capital programme about undertaking major capital projects such as the South Glasgow Hospital or the Queen's Ferry Crossing, which are um, fundamental parts of our uh, capital programme, which makes the achievement of the objective that he set out uh, rather more difficult. My colleague, uh, friend Linda Fabiani, also made the point about the, uh, which is similar to the point Mr Crawford was making, about the partnership that's necessary in our economy between government, trade unions and business to achieve shared objectives. And I want to say, that one of the important elements of the government's policy-making framework is the way in which we um, regularly are in dialogue with both the trade union movement through the biannual meetings between the First Minister and the trade union movement, which have been consistent since 2007 in the election of this government, and the regular dialogue that takes place with business organisations in Scotland to try to encourage the creation of a shared agenda between uh, the government, trade unions and the business community to, to achieve our objectives, and that will be essential in achieving some of the points on the uh, Scottish Business Pledge to which I referred earlier. That is material to securing business support for delivering the living wage, a point which was made by Mr Rowley and also in a different way by uh, Murdo Fraser, who highlighted uh, the fact that the living wage will be a major challenge for some parts of our economy. And I accept that it, there will be parts of the economy that will really struggle to deliver the, the, the living wage. But I don't think we should um, particularly um, compartmentalise sectors of the economy that will find that difficult. This morning, Mr Fraser made the point the hospitality industry would find that difficult. This morning, I, I visited the Rabies Travel Company in Edinburgh, who are a very successful travel business in Scotland and a very successful hospitality business who decided to pay the, the living wage to all of their staff. And the productivity improvements and the performance improvements yeah. they've had as a consequence have justified absolutely every bit of the investment that they made. Now, in the time remaining available to me, I want to talk about the oil and gas sector because um, where this debate, I think, has turned and what is important is to question what is the intervention that will truly make a difference in challenging the oil price difficulties that exist within the North Sea oil and gas sector today. And both Mark Macdonald and Christian Allard, uh, I thought very powerfully in the debate, set out the contribution from the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, who said, we know that the fiscal regime needs to be addressed. Nearly two thirds of respondents to their survey 
told the Chamber of Commerce that was the issue that had to give. And when you look through the four key priorities that Mr Collier, the Chief Executive of Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, highlights, all of these relate to the costs and the fiscal regime that are taken forward, the importance also of collaboration uh, and the maximisation of economic recovery. And if we look at what Malcolm Webb, the Chief Executive of Oil & Gas UK, has said, He's indicated that the two major challenges are industry inefficiency and United Kingdom government economic uh, energy policy. And the, the need to improve the fiscal regime is fundamental to achieving a better future for the oil and gas industry. Of course, I'll give way. I'm, I'm very grateful Jones. to Mr Swinney. Will he also acknowledge that what Malcolm said this week was that given the need for the industry to urgently reduce its own costs and increase its efficiency, Jim Murphy's proposal to introduce a resilient fund which can be used by local authorities to help those affected by adverse conditions, economic conditions, seems Quite sensible. Please, Mr. And if Malcolm Webb thinks that that seems sensible, can the Scottish Government not at least to agree to assess uh, its Mr. potential Mr McDonald, impact John Swinney, you must draw to a close, please. Uh, I, 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 will, I will draw to a close uh, simply by saying that um, Jackie Bailey um, has indicated to us that setting up an oil fund will take money from public services, so it's a rather remarkable co uh, con uh, change in position we've had from the Labour Party. This Government recognises the significance Audrey, please, and the now importance out of, time. of the oil and gas industry to Scotland. We will take forward all of the interventions that we can within our powers, stewarded by Mr Ewing, who puts in a power of effort to, to, to take forward dialogue with the oil and gas industry. But the key difference that will, that will make all of the impact for the oil and gas industry is an improvement in the fiscal regime of the United Kingdom Government, and we ask them to take that forward now. Thank you. That concludes the debate on boosting the economy. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And I remind members that a revised version of Section A of today's uh, business bulletin uh, was issued earlier today, and it includes parliamentary bureau motions on committee membership and substitution on committees. The next item of business is consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions, and I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 12011 and 12012 on committee membership, and motions number 12013 and 12014 on substitution on committees on block, please. Moved on block. Many thanks. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. And I would wish to remind members that in relation to the debate on boosting the economy, if the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown falls. The first question then is that amendment 11993.3 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend motion number 11993 in the name of John Swinney on boosting the economy, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11993.3 in the name of Jack Bailey is yes, 31, no, 64. There were 15 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at amendment 11993.4 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 11993 in the name of John Swinney on boosting the economy. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 11993.4 in the name of Gavin Brown is yes, 15, no, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That then brings us to the next question, which is that Motion 11993 in the name of John Swinney on boosting the economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, and therefore we will now move to a vote. Please cast your votes now. Order, please. The result of the vote on motion number 11993 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 58, no, 52. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That then brings us to the fourth question, and I propose to ask a single question on motions number 12011 to 12014 on committee membership and substitution on committees. If any member objects to a single question being put, could you please say so now? Since no member has objected, the next question then is that motions 12011 to 12014 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership and substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament uh, is agreed and that therefore concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs>